So if we could give our first massive One Young World welcome, please, to Reem al and Rania Neme. Thanks, David. Nothing really resembles what the One Young World Summit is about more than you two's song, One. Now, in that song, Bono sings, one life, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. To me, it truly highlights how we should all think of each other as a collective humanity that's unified and together. Everyone should be doing their part to carry each other. And we at OFID, the OPIC Fund for International Development, are doing just that. And today, we'd like to share with you what we do and how we do it in 130 countries worldwide. So, how many here know what the term sustainable development means? Please raise your hands. Please raise your hands. Okay, quite, quite a, few. a few. Wow. <laughs> okay, well, let's just get a little further, deeper into it. So, as some of you already know, there are various definitions for sustainable development. But the one that really put the concept in the forefront of the international agenda was the one taken from the Brundtland Report. Now, in 1987, a report was published called Our Common Future. And this um, defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, since then, sustainable development has been widely recognized to encompass three pillars, social, uh, social progress, economic growth, and environmental protection. However, just consider a poor family of 10 living on less than $1 a day somewhere in a rural, remote area, a village in Africa. How can we possibly ask them to think about future generations when they're barely able to meet and survive the, their present needs? And today is exactly what we are trying to focus on. Um, OFID belongs to a large number of developmental institutions worldwide who are taking action on the ground, assisting poor and low-income countries and helping millions of people worldwide. But what makes OFID different is that we are a team of 12 countries who they themselves are developing countries and have committed themselves to what we call South-to-South -South solidarity. Now, well, on the map, which will come in a minute, you will see um, all the countries that we actually uh, work in, which, as it will come, is um, 130 countries around the world, spanning from Latin America, there we are, to Africa, to Asia, although the bulk is actually uh, more in Africa. Now, OFID is an organization that comes up with solutions, supporting developing countries to meet their objectives and also meeting um, internationally agreed targets, such as the Millennium Development Goals. Now, when we think of development, we um, really do think of these MDGs. These are eight goals that were set by the United Nations in the year 2000 to be achieved by 2015 and designed to reduce poverty levels. These goals are? Well, the first is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. The second is to achieve universal primary education. The third is to promote gender equality and empower women. And the fourth is to reduce child mortality. The fifth is to improve maternal health. The sixth is to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. The seventh is to ensure environmental sustainability. And the eighth is the Global Partnership for Development. However, at OFID, we realized, along with other um, institutions such as UNIDO, the World Bank, and the IEF, that one of the missing MDGs is that of energy access. And this is why we have been working together towards the alleviation of energy poverty. We believe that without this goal, none of the other eight MDGs can be achieved sustainably. Therefore, we refer to this as the missing ninth Millennium Development Goal. Of course, we all know what energy is, of course, but energy poverty is the lack of access by the poor to modern energy services that are safe and affordable and sustainable over time. Now, to make you understand a little bit about what energy poverty really is, it looks something like this, pitch darkness. 
So that means you will not have basic electricity, basic energy. You will be taking a shower without light, you will be studying without light, you will be doing your basic daily tasks without light. You will not have TV, you will not have Google, and as we saw earlier, definitely no Facebook, which means your voice will not be heard, you will not be connected to the world. It means that your life will depend completely on sunshine. Now to go a little bit more in depth about energy poverty, we wanted to share with you some shocking numbers and facts today. And I urge you to please keep this in your minds throughout the summit and think of all the other people who don't have access to energy. Rani. Now to reiterate these facts even further, three billion people, which is almost half of humanity, rely solely on solid fuels, such as wood, charcoal, waste, for cooking and heating, as the available modern energy services fail to meet their needs. Energy poverty is also dubbed the silent killer. So over 1.6 million deaths per year occur because of energy poverty, because of burning biomass indoors. 44% of those deaths are children. 60% of the adult deaths are women. It kills more than malaria and tuberculosis combined. Over 4,300 people die every day because of burning biomass indoors. Also, one out of four people have no switch. So, to feel what energy poverty looks like, it actually looks something like, well, this. This is a picture taken of students gathered at an airport in Guinea to study after school because it is the only place that they actually have for light. Now, unfortunately, this is the reality in almost a quarter of the world's population. But I think um, there is no other way to explain to you what it really feels like other than to introduce a live example. And um, analysis of poverty data in Armenia showed that the best escape from uh, poverty was agriculture. So Ofit and Ifad joined forces in 2009 to co-finance the Farmers Access Market Program. Now Ofit's role in that program was to do the gas connectivity to specific regions that didn't have energy or electricity. Now I'd like to introduce, of course, Ms. Anahit, who's pictured here with her two grandchildren. Now the reason her story is so important is because our Director General traveled to the Lori region, to the Vahagani village, and inaugurated this project and lit the first stove with the mayor of that village in her home. During that time, he noticed a woman that was very sad in the background. He asked why, and he discovered that her husband, who was Miss Anahit's son, died at the age of 24 while collecting forest and wood for energy. This is something we all don't understand. So of course, needless to say, after this project, there will no longer be any more deaths. And um, maybe we can go and show yeah, the video. No, as Reem just highlighted, it is projects like these is how energy poverty actually becomes history. Um, we would now like to show you a short video which will further demonstrate to you the impact that, uh, that energy access has had on remote Armenian populations. The Asadarian family from the Karabert village of the Shirak region is busy with day-to-day -day life. Though today their livelihood resembles the typical lifestyle of the Armenian capital, Yerevan, things were very different three years ago. I had three grandchildren at the time. We lived simply, lighting oil lamps and heating the furnace. There was no electricity and no natural gas, so with great heartache we cut fruit trees for firewood. These were arduous years, very arduous. It was practically impossible to heat the house, so we depended on an extra layer of clothes to keep us warm at night. We blindly changed our children's clothes in the dark while they shivered in the cold. Shorty of Kanang, Shorty of Gilman. 
Sartenik's reminiscence of dark and cold days is a typical story across Armenia, from the small villages to the bustling capital city of Yerevan. After the Soviet Union collapsed, the main sources of heat ranged from firewood and manure to sheets of paper, or even the odd wheel of a vehicle, anything that could be set ablaze and provide some warmth. Ovens had long lost their original purpose and become nothing more than antiquated furniture, while centralized heating and electrical systems deteriorated and collapsed. Eight to ten years ago, natural gas slowly began its restoration in Armenia. The flicker of the blue flame acted as a warm reminder that the 21st century had begun. Even in the remote village of Karabert, the quality of life began improving dramatically. This was certainly the case for Ashot Bagdasarian's family, who are Asaturian's closest neighbors. For the last four years, the restoration of the natural gas supply was the talk of the town. To be honest, we thought it was nothing more than hearsay. It was about two years ago when we learned from a radio show that some fund, uh, OFID, OPEC, whatever the name, they were lending millions of dollars to Armenia. December of 2010 was a month of unprecedented heat in Armenia. Karabert without snow in mid-December is something to behold. Of course, Asaturian's family was quite pleased since they no longer needed to heat the house, which led to enormous savings. However, their home is adequately equipped with natural gas and they are prepared for the worst. Having a supply of natural gas is amazing. We are much more confident. Now we aren't worried that the wind will extinguish the stove's heat. Solar oil and firewood are very different and gas is quite special as it heats uniformly. Plants are very sensitive to temperature changes and can easily shrivel. The stove was causing pollution and was not only uncomfortable, but heated very poorly. Now it's both clean and comfy, and hot water is available whenever you need it. Tigranui gained not only heat and hot water, but also her husband and brother, Armen and Arsen. Gor and David have both directly and indirectly benefited from the restoration of gas. In April, the family planned their expenses and purchased a second TV set and DVD player for their children. This would not have been possible without the transition to more efficient fuel sources. This year, they plan to use their additional savings on a computer. Under the FMAP program, natural gas pipelines were rehabilitated and or constructed in 79 communities all over Armenia. The number of potential beneficiary households is 32,423. The total number of potential beneficiaries is 127,374 people. The number of actual household connections to the natural gas system is 5,643. The total length of natural gas pipelines is 577,521 meters. Um, we are very lucky that we actually had electricity to watch this video. So I hope you keep these issues in your mind, especially energy poverty. And of course, that Bono's words would resonate with you, that we all get to carry each other. And just to say one final thing, uh, we at Ofid really believe in activities that are aimed towards capacity building, which is why we tend to lend our support to events such as this, the One Young World, because we want to ensure that your voices will be heard. Thank you. Q&A session.
session now. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, um, pleasure to be with you. My name's Connie. Dream Rania, fantastic, and I think uh, energy poverty and uh, actually finding solution is an absolute must uh, for a future if we want to have one worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you see this microphone, the usual journalist's weapon. Uh, I'm going to come to you, but there are also microphones here in the room, and if you ask me why I've got the iPhone in my hand, uh, you know the multi-purpose weapon uh, also has a stopwatch. Um, we're going to try what these two gentlemen have already said. Um, your contribution, uh, uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. I'm actually going to make you aware of how long a statement can be, and I have already talked for one minute. So, ladies and gentlemen, in order to actually sort of uh, give your ideas a voice, you actually need to get up, you see the microphones, look around, get up, and then you can actually pose a question to these fabulous uh, two ladies. Just get up, get moving, and uh, grab the microphone. And Kate, Alternatively, and I, Kate and I just got up to say, come on, let's get, in, get involved, get up. You know, it's kind of early and everyone's a bit asleep, so let's have lots of interaction and challenging questions and comments. Alternatively, uh, Mohamed uh, is the first one, so give him a big applause uh, for doing that. Um, as far as the rules are concerned, if you say your name, that doesn't count for your statement. After that, every second counts. So you go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Mohamed Reza Palaiti. Um, uh, my nickname Reza. I come from Indonesia. Uh, actually, I, I'm still studying Bogor Agriculture University. I'm working with also Center for, for Policy Reform. I really agree with the alleviating energy poverty because um, it's the really, really important things that we have to do in this world, especially in many developing countries. Uh, what I want, what that I want to uh, share about is when we want to alleviate energy poverty, so we have to combine uh, the triple uh, things. The triple first is uh, academicians, and the second is business, businessmen, and the third is uh, government. So how the OFID can work with these triple uh, elements? No, how great. they work, work, can work with that? Because in my country, we that, have already That was it, that was 40 properly. seconds. Thank you so much. Was absolutely yes. fantastic 40 seconds. Right. One well done. <laughs> one young word. One young word, one vision, one heart to getting uh, the glories <laughs> of the world. Okay, that was the running advertisement spot. Now over to you. Well, it's actually a very good question. Um, what's, by the way, Indonesia is one of the 12 countries, which I mentioned before. <laughs> and what's interesting is that OFID works with public and private sector. So it combines the two together. And when we do and deal with energy poverty in some of the developing countries that we work with, we actually respond to their demand. And that sometimes it's a mix and combination of very different things. So we don't come and dictate our specific solution. It varies from the 100, 130 countries that we work with. Every country is different. A a Asia, Africa, Latin America, everything is different. So yeah. that's... Thank you very much. Uh, the answers also should be brief. Thanks very much uh, on that, Rima. I have already three next uh, uh, people, no longer than 40 seconds. The gentleman at the microphone uh, in the center first, then the one before that, and the one to the left, and I'll be coming to the lady over there in a second. So take it away. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ricardo from Nicaragua. Uh, I'm wondering, there's something that caught my attention. I'm sorry to be very skeptical. I know it's very important to bring electricity to poor communities and the developing countries, but uh, you said that the OPEC is giving a loan to the country. What happens if the country cannot pay back those loans? What do you ask in return? Do you ask resources from the country or exactly how it works? Thank you. Well, first of all, it's Thank not you. open. <laughs> Let's, let's quickly collect. Um, the next one was in the middle, in the front. And this uh, person was great because you put a poignant question. It's your turn now. Answer. They want the answer. answer. They oh, want the okay. answer. Then let's do it. Sure. Then do the collection later. Um, actually, what you mentioned happens a lot. Yeah, of course. And um, our, our financing mechanisms is so diverse and it's so long term. So there are countries that we've worked with for years. And what we do is we try to work very closely with the specific country that has maybe fallen back or hasn't been able to meet the specific phases throughout the project. So we've never really failed any of the countries that we work with. 
in a nutshell. So this is one particular aspect by virtual that financing is very important. Now the gentleman in the middle who is uh, so kindly hidden up to now. Um, hi, my name is Bruce. I'm a delegate from South Africa. Um, I... <laughs> Okay. You have 40 yeah. seconds start yeah. now. Uh, um, I uh, apologize, I have a bit of a stutter, so it might take me a bit longer to okay. ask my question. Um, okay. You spoke about, um, about energy poverty with people being, uh, being a silent killer, with people who are, are dependent on renewable sources of energy like wood, um, dying from wood smoke, and you s spoke about once they become dependent on a fossil fuel-based source of energy that the deaths will stop. Uh, I'm just curious to know, what about the, the deaths, um, the climate change-related deaths caused by carbon, uh, mm, mm -hmm. carbon, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm. hold on, carbon emissions, yeah. Yes, well done. Well done. <laughs> It's a very good question, you know, because uh, what we are concerned about is actually people have nothing, zero access to energy, zero electricity. So, of course, we're welcoming also projects that create a good mix and a good balance between maybe renewable or whatever suits their needs. Also, yeah. uh, just to add to that, I think Mr. Hoyer, our director for um, information, wanted to add a few words on this topic. Are you there? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you own, uh, take my microphone, and for you the same applies. Forty seconds. Yeah. No, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, we believe that uh, in order to solve energy poverty, we need a, fu a fuel mix. So we are not preaching about fossil fuels. As a matter of fact, we sponsor. We have a sponsor a projects in geothermal, hydroelectricity, all type of renewable. So, but there is a transition. And we have to be clear that everybody deserves the type of services we have in developed countries, and that's what we're helping to promote. But it's a transition, and we strongly believe that it's a fuel mix, and we are helping in all type of uh, fuels. Thank you very much. The 40-second works. Um, there's a gentleman over there who's going to put the next question in a short time. Hi, my name is Saurabh uh, from Siemens, Germany, but representing India. Quick question on what do you think uh, is more effective, uh, supporting governments and their programs on uh, elevating energy poverty or supporting social entrepreneurs who really work on the ground directly to make the impact? What is your experience? Well, we work very closely with our governments, with the partner country governments, but that doesn't mean that we are not open to you know, specific projects that are small scale, like you said, for social entrepreneurs. We do everything. We do a mix of everything. We do grants, public sector, private sector, and even trade finance. Mm -hmm. So we don't believe in a one model solution. We try to combine all. So like you said, yes, we do work with the governments directly, and sometimes in cases we work with NGOs on the ground. Thank you very much. Uh, the lady here had um, asked to get the word in now. My name is Ingrida. I'm from Lithuania. Um, I wanted to ask you, in these projects, that, in these development projects that you do, do you use the local workforce, the local engineers, in addition to the people who actually build the pipelines? Do you do any training there? Or do you bring in your own people? Because to achieve the MDGs, um, creating employment sort of helps with most of them. So, yeah. Just wondering about that. Uh, Thank absolutely. you very much. Quick answer. Of course, these projects are very large scale. So imagine a highway being built or uh, an entire telecommunication infrastructure. So we usually always, of course, use the local uh, labor. And um, it's done through a bidding process. And that's, that's how it works. We don't bring in our own engineers. We don't have engineers. <laughs> And sorry, just to add to that also, um, all of our projects have a, a component of capacity building anyway with them. So this would include, uh, you know, local, uh, local help, local work. And the last question comes from the gentleman who's been uh, very patiently waiting for his 40 seconds. And may I just say uh, that you're all fantastic. 40 seconds works. Hello, my name is Ayub Tijani. I am from the Republic of Chad. 
My question is, uh, what, what are the requirements to get uh, your, your, your uh, OFAD in my country? We need electricity. Mr. Tijani, thank you very much for that, and uh, we'd love to talk to you after this session, of course, because oh. it's a quite and a long and detailed <laughs> answer. We'll, we'll go into detail, very, very much detail with you. I mean, these two ladies have been identified, uh, the program officer has been identified, so sure. approach them, grab them uh, by the collars, and uh, uh, <laughs> tell them these are our needs on the ground, and I believe uh, from uh, all the conferences that I've attended uh, on energy poverty. It's a multifaceted approach. Yes. Thank you very much Thank for you, your Connie. good work that Thank you're you. doing with Thank all you. of Thank you. you. And sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.